Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Capella webinar series. Okay, so let's begin this new webinar. So first of all, uh, I am Laurent Delegue. I've been working at Obeo for the last 15 years and uh, specifically in the MBSC domain for the last uh, six or seven years. And today I'm very happy to act as a chairman for this new webinar in our Capella series, which is entitled Making, Cap Making Arcadia sorry, Work for You a look at framework tailoring in Thales UK. And without further ado, it's time for me to introduce our speakers today, uh, Andrew Pemberton and Alex Lane. So Andrew has a degree in electronic systems engineering from Cranfield University, 17 years experience across defense, aerospace and ground transportation, delivering and defining systems engineering. He's currently the modeling referent for Teles UK, delivering modeling approach definition, training, coaching, and mentoring across Teles UK businesses and projects. In addition, Andrew is the president-elect of the UK chapter of INCOSI, leading systems engineering direction across UK industry. And Alex has a degree in computer science and microprocessor systems from Strathclyde University, 16 years software experience and 21 years systems engineering experience in defense, designing, developing, integrating, and testing ESM, ECM, radar, and UAV systems. He is an MBSC specialist in Thales UK, currently working in engineering support, delivering modeling approach definition, training, coaching, and mentoring across Thales UK businesses and projects. And now, uh, gentlemen, the floor is yours, so I will just mute myself. Thank you very much, Laurent, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So we're going to have a look at uh, tailoring of Arcadia and, and the approach that specifically we've taken within one of the projects in ISR in UK to how we're going to apply the Arcadia and Capella tool to our, to our problem space. First, looking at a, bit of, a little bit of the outline of the talk, we need to, uh, to start by acknowledging what Arcadia gives us and where we start from, uh, and then looking at some of the reasons why we might tailor from there. Uh, I cover a little bit about how the culture shift um, in Talis is affected by this or can be affected by this. And then we, uh, we'll move on to Alex looking at where the model fits within the design, within the overall data model of the, the whole uh, engineering piece, looking at different approaches at the different levels of Arcadia. Um, and then we'll come back to having a look at some of the pitfalls that we often see and a bit of a summary, and then a bit of time for questioning at the end. So Arcadia, it's where we begin. It's the standard approach in Thales to solution architecture design. It supports the implementation of a model-based method. Uh, and in Thales, this is delivered through the Capella tool. Uh, and obviously, you can see the four levels of Arcadia there uh, in, our, in the diagram we all know and love. Um, so it's an architecture-focused method of design, looking at viewpoint-based method with uh, multiple related diagrams, traceable elements, to provide a different, a number of different con contextual perspectives of that of the system and of interest. Uh, five main levels in Arcadia, four of them shown here, uh, looking at different levels of abstraction to address the need, through to building multiple different views of the system, both black box and white box, all the way through down to the the physical architecture and deployment, uh, as shown on here. Four of those levels are shown there. Um, it organizes the information that can define a system using model elements that make up different diagrams or views of the model, uh, such as arch architecture diagrams of linked parts or diagrams showing ordered exchanges of information. What it does give us is the what. It tells us what we can do. So it tells us which elements exist, and it tells us which, how we can relate those elements and in what diagrams we can create that produce views of those of those elements. But it doesn't tell us how to use those diagrams. It doesn't tell us how we have to present those views to meet our stakeholder needs. Um, and if done 
in its full right, if you went through and produced everything, it is quite a heavyweight approach to architectural design. Uh, so now we're going to look at really why would we move on from Arcadia or why do we start to tailor that and how uh, and to cover how we've done that for our problem space. So first thing really is stakeholder engagement. This is probably the hardest single thing on most of the projects that I deal with. It's a recurring theme across MBSC uh, using MBSC across Talis. Um, a modeling approach is seen as different to how design is being captured. In reality, it's not that different. It's just more graphical and, um, and for, importantly, it's more rigorous, consistent and, and formal way of capturing things. So our stakeholders have different needs. They need to different sets of information. Some people need big picture views to be able to see everything linked up. Some people need a very specific subset or, or part of that view to, to look at how they validate a specific piece of information. Um, and and so reviewers may need something contextual to be able to understand how it's being, uh, how their specific set of information applies to, to them. There's also the need for views and understand how to publish this into documentation or presenting it to your different stakeholders. Um, so one of the drivers for this is actually you know collaboration, making sure people engage, come along for the journey um, and, and understand what they need. And some of that is they don't always know what they need. So you have to give them something, collaborate with them, work with them to understand their needs and then uh, adapt what you're doing and tailor what you're doing to their needs. And this is where an iterative approach comes in, where we design something, we do a bit of modeling, uh, we present that back, gets reviewed, and then we take in that feedback and update and repeat this process. And be that for a single diagram where we're trying to, does this meet your needs? Actually, can it show this? Can it show that? Okay, yeah, we'll go away, do a bit of an update, come back, quick iterations so that you get to something that the stakeholder eventually needs and wants um, and then multi if you if you do that for one capability for example you can then iterate that across the rest of the capabilities so that once you've got to a, an established uh, view set that people are happy with you can quickly generate that for the rest of the the other capabilities missions whatever uh, element of interest um, delivering only the views that are necessary for stakeholders. Uh, so actually, we can model a lot of things, but understanding and engaging with your stakeholders to know what they need is critical. So some of the tailoring is around that. <clears throat> and some of it is about how you actually navigate within the tool um, and, if you, uh, if, and how you set up your various parts of the, the project so that you can navigate across both using the uh, the the in tool uh, the browsers were available to you within the tool, but also if you're extracting that into documentation documentation, and that's the third point here is how are we supporting the publication of documents? And there's some things we've done to tailor our approach in order to support that. So I mentioned earlier that we are looking at culture shift within Talis. And we have these six pillars uh, that are part of our culture manifesto. Um, and as I was putting this presentation together, I realized that realistically, we are, but through our approach, underpinning all of these pillars. Uh, and so if we work through them, empowerment over control. So actually giving people the information they need to do their job rather than keeping it for yourself and 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 only allowing bits and pieces for people to, to see really is about giving them the all of the information they need and giving them the authority and the responsibility to go and manage their the processes they need to do themselves. Um, so it, moving on to data over uh, opinion, if things are kept in people's heads, as quite regularly they are in, in a lot of engineering culture, um, a lot of it is about opinion and different people's interpretation of that opinion and the, and the engineering information available. We're capturing a robustly, rigorously, and consistently a set of data that everybody has access to, 
are these rather than having it being people's in people's heads and in an, opi an opinionated version it is the raw data that people are dealing with um, test and learn over plans so rather than having we're going to do a big plan of action to deliver uh, in three six nine months having testing out some of the approaches we're taking actually the bit i mentioned where we go back iteratively to our to our stakeholders and say is this working for you what more do you want to see which other bits of information do you want and actually testing that with them to see what works um, and learning from their feedback collaboration over protection again this is about a lot of information being held in people's heads so getting that information out of people's heads into a common structure into a centralized database where people can actually access it means that you get more collaboration more engagement with people over the uh, information users over customers this is really a, a, a really strong cultural shift in my mind that you need to have those people rather than just can you go away give me a model and in three, six months time, you come back and give them a model and they are effectively buying your service and you're done. Making them into a user, making them engaged, bringing them along for the journey actually is really critical to that. Uh, and finally, failure of not trying. Actually, there has been a number of cases where we've tried things. We've put things up in front of the customer and they've gone, no, that's not what we're looking for. Um, and actually trying things and putting them up there without that sense of, foreboding oh what if i get it wrong no just going for it really and and quickly and iteratively trying a few things and accepting that some of it won't work and won't, won't land is critical to this uh, and now we're going to move on to alex to to explain some of how this has been delivered within this project so good afternoon so today um, I'm going to touch on the approach being being taken in the ISR, which stands for Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance uh, Business Unit in the UK in the use of Capella uh, at the system level. So say just purely focusing at the system um, level of design, not anything below subsystem at the moment, because that is where the model uh, sits. The Just to give you a bit of background um, <clears throat> within ISR. The systems we do uh, are generally very tailored to work towards each specific customer with very small production runs, often maybe one or two of uh, big systems. And historically, the system level design of our systems has been a, a, various, a mix of various data artifacts that has been put together through uh, initially through the bid phase of projects and then um, evolved through um, the actual development uh, and design phases. These would have been consolidated into a single uh, design document. Um, however, they tended to disrespect, in my opinion, they tended to disrespect the design boundaries at each level of design. So, for example, we would have system level design documents that contained subsystem level detailed subsystem level design information um, and while they tended to be a good uh, read they weren't very coherent in terms of the overall design and quite often conflicted with lower level design information so moving to a model-based approach uh, to capture uh, the functional and physical architecture of the system has helped make the design more joined up um, and in capturing uh, it in a model has identified areas of the design which were either weak or which needed revisiting. Because as we all know, people tend to focus on the things they know about the design and the, the difficult bits are kind of left towards the end. So the systems we develop um, are evolutions of previous systems. Um, while they introduce new technologies, they have been researched uh, until their technology um, readiness level has matured to the point at which we're confident about including them into our systems. Um, so you could call that a bottom-up uh, approach to design. Um, but after that, we then need to go back up to the top level and formally capture the design 
um, from a, a more top-down approach. So <clears throat> all this is showing is what I, you know, we, as we all know, we've got level of requirements at one level, some requirements at one level, we go through some design cloud, whatever that is, and we get some lower level uh, requirements. So looking at this very simplistic um, data model, uh, we've got requirements um, that are maybe associated to the design. The design in this case is uh, being represented in the model. And as I say, historically uh, within our business unit, the link uh, or the relationship rather between, so here for the relationship between the design over here and the requirements and the relationship between the derived requirements and the design tended to be very um, informal and certainly not very well joined up. So having this model and using the um, other other tools around it was not just about Capella, um, but other tools around it within Talus has helped make that a, a more joined up approach. So you will see that we are not using a logical architecture, as, which is one of the sort of tailoring uh, approaches we've taken. Uh, and the the rationale for that is that the, in order to get the adoption of uh, a model based approach into the business, it was it has been um, I would say quite difficult to do because of you know previous um, previous ways of working and why why should we want to change so one of the the things that we kind of had to let go to order in order to get it uh, put in was we'll say well let's let's park the logical architecture for now hopefully that will be coming you know we'll, future projects we'll be able to develop that uh, and and make it uh, make it useful the other area i just wanted to mention um so again andrew touched on it earlier we're not we're not going to be modeling everything within Capella. Um, I think it's fairly normal. So the um, we have got, as I said before, we've got existing data artifacts um, from previous projects. Um, this is a, an evolution uh, of a previous system with some uh, enhancements. And so therefore we are, we've got these data artifacts around. So we've got things like a well-developed system ICD in a spreadsheet. We've got budget spreadsheets in terms of their structure and format. We're, we're going to maintain those, but we will keep them all in our design uh, cloud and um, use uh, the linking um, of a separate tool, Rectify, in order to link that into the model um, and show where it joins up. And finally, in terms of this this picture, we've got a method of generating documents. Again, we use uh, a, a Talus tool uh, called Mozart, which assembles um, documents based on data. Some of that data will come from, uh, depending on the document that you want to generate, some of the data will come from the model, some will come from other data artifacts, some will come from requirement sources, and we generate a number of uh, documents. and. Again, historically, these documents have been manually generated, uh, mostly manually generated. The requirement documents would have been generated from doors, uh, typically. But uh, again, it's trying to get people, it's trying to let's get the stakeholders to understand and agree that the document that is being generated in this format um, will will look slightly different because of the source data coming from the model that's, that, is, that is in it. So again, in, um, I should probably mention uh, that we are, at this point, we're using uh, Capella version 1.4.2. So it's a relatively old version compared to the current versions um, version that's available. And I'm sure that uh, many Capella users uh, do a sim the same or similar to what we are doing within ISR because I believe it's just 
it's normal, but it's good to share uh, anyway. In um, Capella, in the Project uh, Explorer section, there's uh, the model elements are grouped by type and structured in some some regards. Um, but we have, again, I think it's fairly normal, but we have enhanced that uh, by grouping the um, the information. So we've got, uh, for example, capabilities. We've got our primary capabilities, capabilities which extend and capabilities which include other capabilities. And each capability, um, everything that's relevant effectively to that capability as a package, um, we capture as uh, information and views below that. So in the physical architecture, we've done a similar thing where we've got architecture views and we've got context uh, contextual views based on the components. Um, and the architecture views, again, from an ease of navigation point of view is structured. Again, I don't think that this is any any uh, sort of rocket science, but it's. Um, I have seen other projects, uh, Capella projects, um, that just leave the structure uh, and leave the model elements wherever they are created um, by default. So again, the uh, at the SA level, um, we are using uh, contextual views rather than the blank views. So from the um, the main sort of uh, uh, windows in, in uh, Capella, it sort of leads you through creating mission blanks and mission capability blanks. Um, and those get created, um, but they, they can't be moved under a capability or under a mission. So we've, we tend to use the um, contextual uh, mission and contextual capability views so that they can be placed under the capability or under the mission. It makes the um, uh, these diagrams easier um, to be uh, exported uh, and assembled into documents. It uh, makes it easier, in my my opinion, for the uh, you know, a user who's maybe not familiar, not that familiar with uh, the, the structure of Capella to, to find elements related to uh, diagrams related to model elements. We do use um, what I'd call full or all up views um, of uh, mission blanks and mission capability blanks to provide an all up picture, but they're generally for a model uh, modeler's perspective. <clears throat> and it also goes without saying that uh, we have added, um, again, it's normal practice, I think, We've enriched the model by adding descriptions to the appropriate model elements um, where relevant. So obviously a diagram can tell a story. We have, because we are introducing this within our business unit, we have lots of users who can't read these diagrams um, very well. They don't understand what they're saying. Um, and so we've had to, well, I think it's good practice anyway even if you were creating these diagrams in Visio or whatever, to have a description of what the diagram is saying. So we provide detailed descriptions of, of that um, in, terms of, in terms of the purpose. So again, using the contextual views, we've got contextual mission views and then the contextual capability views to focus in on, on those. We have used um, system architecture blanks instead of the uh, data flow blanks, although we've, we have created both. Um, the, the, the views are, these views are created, um, focused around a, a capability. So the, the views are contextual based Based and they're based on part of a capability or either the whole capability, and it keeps them neatly packaged and again exportable. So we have we tend to use um, and prefer using the uh, the architecture blank views because it puts the um, uh, the functions uh, uh, it shows the context of the functions on their on their 
components and the structural elements. And it'll also show the um, allocation of the functional changes, functional, functional exchanges on the component exchanges. We also use um, uh, functional chains um, to capture the functional paths through uh, related to the cap capabilities um, that are covered by these uh, diagrams. Um, and there may be one or many. And again, depending on the complexity of the functional chains at the system level, um, the functional chains, we're trying to keep them we're trying to keep the number of functions to a, a, a fairly small level. Um, so, but, so the functional chains can be quite simple, but some of them can be quite complex. And if they're complex, then we tend, uh, we would use um, uh, exchange scenarios uh, to capture, capture that. So this is just showing some examples. Again, I think it's fairly normal. Um, the functional chains can be misinterpreted uh, if they're not uh, drawn out. We also, again, probably fairly normal, but we, we capture a, uh, we, we maintain a, a big picture view. Um, so this is showing uh, the functions, all the functions um, at the system level. So there's around 40 um, at the system and about the same number on the actors as well. Uh, and it allows us to throw on functional chains from a modeling point of view, to throw on functional chains to see how they're rooted, while at the same time seeing the bigger picture, you know, what other functional exchanges come into a particular function, um, etc. cetera. Um, the, uh, one of the things on this particular uh, view is that we we, we don't hide anything. We don't hide any functions or functional exchanges. Whereas obviously on the other the other views, um, there are functions and functional exchanges that are hidden. And uh, we have had, as part of the, the reviewing with the, the stake, stakeholders, we have had users coming back and saying, um, looking at a, a particular uh, diagram that's got some functions on it and then making comments on that diagram which says well this function uh, does more than um, you know than what what you're actually covering here but the function may be used in a number of different capabilities um, so only part of that the need of that function uh, is covered in one particular diagram and the rest of it, Although the same function is shown in a different diagram, it will be uh, the other part of that uh, function will be will be covered. So it's um, it, it's trying to uh, one of the one of the issues that we've had, and we'll probably touch on this at the end, is trying to get um, uh, it's a cultural change, I think, with the, uh, the stakeholders and the the community, um, the engineers within within our business to. Uh, to actually understand what's being drawn, they probably do this. I think they they get users. People go through this process of uh, design anyway, but they don't realize that it's actually modeling. They think that they're just drawing some diagrams and doing things, and they probably are. But it's it's more informal, and so um, having this formal structured approach um, at the core and at, at the, the the heart of uh, what we're doing. Um, has maybe sort of led some people to, to sort of really think about how they're doing their design. A um, couple of other things, uh, just touching, we've probably done a little bit more than this, but again, not rocket science. We we try and keep the same, uh, the default capella coloring style where possible, um, but we, we have on, in some of our views, uh, colored some of the uh, model elements um, to try to just make from a, a visualization and readability point of view, um, those, those bits stand out. Um, and we also, we also use uh, the title blocks uh, reasonably extensively on, on the diagrams. So 
these sorts of things um, to try to throw related model elements uh, or identify related um, model elements um, and identify those on the diagram. So they, because they're title blocks, they're dynamic, and if the model changes, the, the, the title block will update. So we found that those are really quite useful. So for example, we've used them to help clarify uh, the routing of um, physical paths and functional chains. So where, where we've got more than one functional chain or physical path um, using the same uh, functional exchange or physical link, the path turns black. Um, now I know that in later versions of Capella that's been resolved and there's some, some ways of um, identifying which paths go through that, but because we are not using the, those versions of Capella, uh, we have implemented this, um, this approach using title blocks. So this is kind of just a throwaway slide really um, to show that uh, the kind of output that we are looking for and getting, we're, we're not exporting the whole model as is. Um, so we are using a tool called uh, Mozart in uh, Capella, I mean, a Talus in-house tool. Um, but we, we're using this as, so for example, uh, an example of an SSDD where we would have um, at the top, uh, we've got the emissions. Um, so these are the, this is a straight export um, from from the model. So we've got the the model elements, the description of the uh, the mission, the mission contextual view, and then the description of that diagram. And the same with the capabilities as well. So, but model information is also, you know, we also combine model information with um, requirements from doors to generate requirement specifications and also combined with detailed interface information, uh, as I mentioned earlier in spreadsheets uh, to create uh, interface specifications. So in, moving on to the uh, physical architecture, so again, just put in context, we are this particular project, uh, we haven't actually got a uh, contract for yet. So this has all been done during the bid phase. Um, so there's still work to be done at the, um, uh, at the physical architecture. But the reason we've moved on with the physical architecture and created a reasonably um, reasonably detailed physical architecture at the system level is because of what I mentioned earlier in that uh, the approach being used that we've got a reasonably mature system conceptually from a TRL technology readiness level con point of view so that we know and, and it's based on a previous system so we know you know what the system has to do functionally uh, or we think we do um, and we're just packaging it up architecturally it's being packaged up up differently um so this work has been done as at the physical level has been going on in parallel with the um defining the the whole of the sa level and once the sa level is complete in terms of its functions and those functions have been reviewed they will be flowed down and we'll be able to elaborate them at the physical level on the architecture so it's slightly different to maybe if you were having a green field um, and you didn't actually know what your your architectural solution was. We we know we know what ours is. Um, so again, just looking at uh, at this, we've got part of our uh, physical architecture, obviously showing physical links and physical ports, etc. That view might be useful, um, certainly useful from a modeling point of view, certainly useful as another sort of big picture view, but um, it, it doesn't, there's, there's so many more layers that we could put on that and in terms of showing um, you know, specific uh, physical architecture 
design aspects of the system. Um, and they, obviously, when we get into adding the functions, we'll see the behavioral uh, aspects as well. So this is quite useful, but as I say, it's, it's more of a connectivity um, view showing uh, you know, where the red lines, as in physical links, cables uh, are connect, but it doesn't say what they're carry, what's carrying them. So we've we've created um, uh, different types of views, which uh, to to show that. Um, and this is just a couple. So some of the key architectural aspects that we're looking at, so things like power architecture, network architecture, clock architecture, etc. We tend to create views with ju just of those types uh, showing um, physical links with th th that carry those that type of information. Now, bearing in mind, I know that we haven't done the um, uh, the functional uh, uh, part of the model yet, so obviously the functional exchanges will indicate uh, that when we get there. But again, because we were kind of doing this from a sort of bottom up uh, approach, we we know that um, you know particular cables will carry power. We know that particular cables will, those, some, some of those particular cables will also carry clock information. They might carry um, RF information, they might carry uh, network information, or you might get a, a cable that carries all of that. So, um, and one of the things that we have got to do, certainly on this project, which has kind of driven us down this route uh, in uh, any way, is that we are um, we are already being asked for uh, the the sort of um, uh, I guess cable cable information, not the detailed pin information, but the the um, how many cables are we going to be having uh, so they can do look at the cable trays from a um, uh, from an installation um, uh, perspective. The things, although we have got our detailed system ICD in terms of the pin level uh, captured externally from the model, so we're not using uh, interconnection viewpoint um, at this point uh, we are keeping or maintaining the names uh, of the physical links i.e the, the cables keeping those the same as what is in our uh, Excel system ICD spreadsheet and we're keeping the, uh, the physical port names um, the same as the physical connected designations in the same spreadsheet. So that is, it's a sort of um, semi-automated checking that we need to do. It's not, we can link the model elements um, to those, uh, um, you know, to those bits of data in the spreadsheet, but um, it's not an automated, if one changes, the other changes. So again, just on, on this diagram, very. this is again showing the clock architecture for some of the system. This is showing the, um, uh, the power architecture routing uh, for some of the system. And the different colors are different physical paths, which represent different types of clocks or different power levels. Um, and uh, there's a whole load of other physical links that are hidden from these views because the focus of these views are either the clock architecture or the power architecture in that example. And uh, the last thing I wanted to cover um, is really component context views. Uh, having a contextual view of a component for this logical, physical, or whatever is, again, fairly normal. We've created um, a couple of different views. Um, so we've got, which serve different purposes. We've got a very simplistic one here, 
Um, so this type of view would be put into a, uh, for example, a, um, a requirement specification just as a part of the introduction uh, to scope the component uh, that has got the requirements being specified. It doesn't need to, um, it, we, we don't need to know what the, what the actual physical links are that connects this component. We don't need to know um, what these behavioral components of uh, where they sit. Um, it doesn't doesn't really matter from the focus of this this um, uh, this particular component. We're just interested in the external exchanges um, and the the physical connections and obviously the functionality as well. So when we have got the functions, uh, we would provide that as well. Uh, and this this kind of view um, would be more put into a design document and capture more of the design relating to this component. So it shows more of the, the paths. So we've got a physical path going right the way through um, from this component down to here um, with the component exchange just going that way. But the actual routing of it goes through many different components. So from a design point of view, it's, it's more relevant. And as I say, we will continue with this approach. So we'll, have, we'll develop further physical architecture blanks, um, which are created to show the behavioral aspects of the components. Um, so I think, and one thing I will mention, I think uh, Andrew will probably touch on it um, at the end, but we have also created a uh, a wiki page to um, uh, allow interpretation of these. I'll, I'll let you you cover that, Andrew. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you for sharing that detail with us. So just a couple of the, the modeling pitfalls that we, uh, we, we sometimes see people using Capella is a drawing tool, um, sometimes not very well, um, but using some of the elements as uh, unint in unintended ways, uh, or going too deep too early, modeling too much, uh, adding too much detail to things. Some of the views you saw there from Alex, same underlying information presented in multiple views in order to tailor that need to, the, uh, to what the stakeholder wanted to see. Um, or, or its destination in terms of which document it was going into. Um, the and, and this really is the sort of under, I'll come to it back to it in, the, in a moment. But the, not having a modelling plan in the first place, so actually scoping what to model, how it should be modelled, um, and, and you know the, some some places will say we'll start the conversation at which tool should we use without really understanding what the framework is, what how are you going to use that framework to really drive your modeling? Um, and, and thinking that your modeling approach, your framework is the solution. So starting off and going, I'm gonna use Capella or I'm gonna use Arcadia and that's gonna answer the question for you uh, in the same way that how do you manage your requirements? We use doors, um, doesn't really give you the same uh, it's, it doesn't actually tell you how you're going to manage the, the requirements or how you're going to manage your various elements of your architecture. So you actually have to think that next step further about how you're going to use that framework you've been given, uh, how you're going to tailor that to the needs of your stakeholders. Um, and thinking uh, about some of the bits of the system which aren't, uh, aren't understood. So people, as Alex mentioned, it's all too easy to focus on the 80% of the system that you already understand. Uh, and so actually some of the, the views we've presented here helped us to get to understanding where some of the gaps were uh, in our system and understanding which bits of the system were areas that we didn't have the information to hand, especially where legacy data, as Alex said, this wasn't a Greenfield site, this was a an update to an existing uh, technology where we've got a lot of data from potentially decades ago, some of it, and the quality of that varies. And actually putting that into the model helps you to understand where the, uh, which bits of the system are understood and which aren't. Um, and I would say that these are, these pitfalls aren't necessarily just specific to modeling, but design in general. Uh, and finally, just to summarize, 
things that are critical, things I hope you take away from today, continuous engagement with stakeholders. We have to have those stakeholders being treated as users rather than customers. We need them to be really engaged and bought into the, the approach um, and make sure that they know what they want and you know what they want and that you can work to generate the, uh, the elements and the, the diagram, the views in the model that present the information in the way they need it. Um, developing the culture, as we said, talking about the different aspects of this, getting information out of people's heads and, in, and into a, a common centralized source that's rigorous and, and all traceable so that you can actually start to use it um, and everyone can engage with it. Alex introduced this to begin with. This is where Alex started the importance of your data model. So this is obviously Arcadia gives us a linked set of elements, but how do those elements fit into and those views fit into the wider engineering deliverables? Where are they linked to your requirements? Where are they linked to your test? And, and obviously, as Alex showed, you can overlay the tools on this uh, once you understand which engineering artifacts are related to which. Um, and this can really help you understand which bits of Arcadia are going to support your delivery uh, in terms of the levels you're using, as Alex showed, not you currently using the logical architecture, just transitioning through, um, and, and tailoring which aspects of your the Arcadia framework are going to be applicable to your engineering need. Uh, and Alex also mentioned at the end, there's this style guide and there's a, an example here of a, a, an extract from the wiki page talking about how the different diagrams, how the different views have been presented to help people with their interpretation of that. Um, and I think it is, you know, how to read them, how to interpret them. And it has taken some time for uh, for people. And this is partly why the, the wiki exists to really understand and, and to sit with stakeholders to show them what they are, what they're getting. Um, but the key for me is you don't, Whilst Arcadia and Capella give you the ability, and, and Alex mentioned, you can put pretty much anything onto a, a PAB. Um, the PAB is, a, is a, a diagram that has the majority of the physical architecture um, elements can be represented there. But do you stop before you do that and just think, do I need to represent these elements on this diagram? Um, and, and many of the diagrams, if you've got the underlying information related and traceable, can be auto-generated. Uh, so it actually speeds up the approach if you understand which diagrams and which views you need to tailor to your needs. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and we'll, Laurent, welcome you back to uh, guide Yes, thank questions. you very much. Absolutely, we will, uh, without further ado, move to the questions because I can see that you've had a lot of success already by the number of questions. So. Let's start uh, with the first one. How do you work out requirements, management, and traceability within Capella or orchestrating with other tools? So I can answer that. We we use um, uh, Orchestra Framework. It's a Talus um, tool. So the um, Capella is actually part of a suite of tools that we use under um, the Orchestra Framework architecture. So Orchestra includes Rectify, which is our linking tool. It uses, includes um, Mozart uh, documentation publication. It uses a, to, uses a tool called Vivaldi for um, uh, for IVV um, and some other tools as well. It uses Jira um, for, for, for problem reporting. So yes, I hopefully hopefully that uh, answers your question. I think the people with the, the Talus uh, uh, people in the call will probably recognize that. I guess so. Thank you. So next question: Have you ever managed VNV needs in the definition of tailoring? Uh, so, go on, Alex. Well, I was just going. You, on this. <laughs> uh, you can say something as well, Andrew. Of course, um, I was just going to say uh, in terms of. VNV, so the things, as I said, we've got a separate VNV tool, but in terms of the needs, uh, things like um, we, we would use the model elements, for example, a functional chain, and identify those as things that we would need to uh, verify, not just the functions, but they would typically be things that we would link to um, 
again using using rectify under the orchestra uh, framework architecture uh, and linking to them from from vivaldi so um i don't know if that would answer that but andrew you were going to say something yeah i think that's that's the there are projects where whilst we haven't necessarily linked them directly we have extracted the both the functional chains and the scenarios um, for use and, and it's identified in the data model that relationship between those elements and those views with the test cases and test suite in Vivaldi. Okay, thank you very much. So moving to the next questions uh, about bottom-up design. So lots of companies develop new system version based on previous versions. So how is your experience uh, using Capella in bottom-up design? So, I, I, for me, anyway, I think there's two answers to this. I think, or two things that come to come to mind. Um, one is, uh, I think it is, if you bought into using Capella or using modeling, it should be relatively straightforward because you know the architecture. So you can just say, "Well, I know what I, I know what I've got. I just haven't captured it very well." But on the flip side of that. Um, you've also got the people who um, don't see the need to actually change the way that they're doing things already, and so it's been it's been not a struggle, but it's been uh, challenging, let's say, to try to get people to change. And this, it's like Andrew was saying, and, and the summary to the cultural shift, um, uh, you know, introducing introducing Capella. I think that. Um, yeah, that's all I'd say. Andrew, I don't know if you want to add anything. I think in terms of um, it's very easy for, for people to effectively know what their system is going to be in these scenarios where actually sometimes the whilst the lower level hardware and, and software may, may be very similar or it's certainly a decision has already been taken about the physical architecture in a lot of cases in the PBS. Um, actually linking that back through traceably to a context, the system context, and showing, which may well have changed quite significantly in the 10, 15, 20 years since the legacy system was introduced to market, will actually, showing that traceability through will show how potentially parts of that uh, design aren't understood, aren't necessarily understood as well as people believe, uh, and will show gaps and potentially highlight design decisions that were taken decades ago that you don't understand anymore. For example, I, I uh, recall one that where we were discussing why a particular physical allocation was was done in the way it was, uh, and, and allocating functions to four separate. Uh, physical entities uh, and and there's no design rationale that we can find behind that it's just the way it's done each function has its own card now I can be well believe that in the 90s when that decision was originally made the the processing capability of each of those cards was such that they had to be separated in order to be able to deliver the functionality on each card uh, separately and to the level and uh, throughput required but now obviously you could probably combine some of that functionality onto a single card because processing power has increased so much we can start to ask these sort of questions once this data is is linked up um, and, and it really gives you that power to do so so can, can i just come back on that sorry lauren i know you're going to move on very quickly i think one of the other pitfalls I think with bottom-up design is that people tend to get stuck at the bottom level and not actually go back up to the top level and actually understand what the, what it is the system has to do and then relate it back to the and and you know uh, ISR is no different we're really we're working well into the weeds and we have to we have to have separate the levels um, from a from a design point of view totally okay thank you very much so next question uh, you've mentioned that uh, it's taken some time to get MBSE and Capella embedded into the Thales organization. <laughs> what were the main barriers and how did you overcome them? So this is a, an ongoing story. I wouldn't say we're at the, the um, embedded 
in in every aspect um i think this is a, a journey uh and it is hitting pitfalls in different places so um making sure we've got uh, for me it's it's the people it's everything is about the people what we deliver at um Tales is people's expertise uh, yes, eventually that becomes a real life product, but what it, the, the 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 thing we really sell is our is our people's minds, and that cultural aspect, getting people to understand that sharing information is better than hoarding it, um, and having a structured approach so that you're consistent. Um, so there's been a lot of training uh, in terms of tools, in terms of outside of the tools. I mean, it's it's all too easy to go straight to a tool, but actually training people on why we're doing this, why we are developing this culture, why we're developing these approaches, um, so that some of it is that it becomes commonplace, um, and that it you know it's not just when you're doing your design for your big system, um, it, it's the way you think when you're doing all aspects of your your life really, um, and and helping develop people in that aspect and we still get pushback there is always and i would say our biggest pushback and the barrier we still have to overcome and most often is deadlines uh, projects always say will always come and say no nope, let's go and do something different um and and pushing back against that and saying no this stuff this has been done this is captured in a, a formal way we need to continue using this otherwise we're going to lose all of this information yeah uh, and highlighting the risks highlighting risks to people about these is is critical especially when you're dealing with certain stakeholders i i'll just add to that if i may um for me it's it is a cultural change as andrew says um it seems slightly worse in the uk i think than other parts of talus um but it's like it's the same i experienced the same over 20 years ago when doors was first introduced in the uk doors was a different way of doing things in terms of capturing requirements and it's exactly the same so it's, people take people are reluctant to change um the way they the way they work and the way they do things um it's not not specific to mbse and capella um so we'll just keep pushing Okay, I, before we move on, I'd just like to mention that it could be useful to go and watch the latest talk by Stéphane Bonnet during the Capella Days 22, which is related to very much to that question, I believe. Uh, moving on to the next question, how do you maintain the big picture view considering the complexity and amount of work keeping it tidy? We see here that this person <laughs> probably has uh, used Capella before and tried to do that. Whenever the design changes, doesn't that mean that a lot there's a lot of diagramming work? Uh, yes, it does, and unfortunately, um, that is for me anyway. It's the nature of the beast. I don't. I, I think you know Capella does provide some some aids to help lay out it, uh, tools, uh, laying laying it out, but it's never quite what you want to see. So um, it's it's kind of the thing that. Uh, when I've been doing it, um, I've been it's it's regular updates. Going back to it, knowing that some, let's say, some exchanges have been put on, some functions have been put on, and keeping it up to date. The, the worst thing that I've I've um, found is it's like it's like you're having you're going up to your loft. If you clear your loft out regularly, then it's it's an easier job than going up. Uh, and doing it is a is a big thing at the end. <laughs> I, I feel attacked, Alex. I've got yeah. I've got a lot to do right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'd add to that that actually, in some of these cases, there are diagrams that you will never show to stakeholders, um, and potentially keeping that big picture, the one that the modelers are using to establish the links between elements. Uh, rather than the ones you're laying out nicely to present to your stakeholders, sometimes they don't need to be tidy. Um, and and I, I think Alex would agree, there are probably a few in this project where they're hidden in the background and they are a bit of a mess. But you, you know, if you're never gonna show the, the, the diagram that has all of the capabilities linked to all of the missions linked to all of the actors, and you're only going to show contextual diagrams, then actually it's only the contextual diagrams you have to 
to maintain an update and they're much easier to, to work on. Okay, thank you very much. Another question by James. Uh, you've mentioned quite a few modeling rules and conventions. Have you captured them? How have you ca captured these? And how do you enforce all of these among members of the modeling team? So it's hopefully a relatively simple answer and straightforward. We, on the project, uh, we uh, have created a, a SAMP, so a system architecture modeling plan. It's like a traditional engineering management plan, um, but it's um, it covers the, um, the exactly what you've put in the question, the the the, the rules and the conventions and the ways of working, um, what needs to be modelled, um, when you would stop modelling, the views that you would create, etc. And coupled coupled with the um, the wiki uh, page that shows the the views and how to interpret those views and the styles of those views. And that's been shared with uh, the team. OK, thank you. Uh, moving to the next question, uh, still by, by James. What's your balance of trained Capella modelers versus non-system engineers editing the model? And how do you control changes? So. <laughs> Uh, uh, trained Capella modelers uh, is we are very few, in fact, um, within uh, within ISR, um, and there's a again there's a I think there's a lot of people that um, understand the model, but maybe uh, you know and understand what they're saying, but they're maybe afraid of in quotes breaking the model. So um, this we get. Uh, because of the, the the wiki page, there's people that can you know easily understand what the model is telling them. When we publish information for review, uh, they can understand what it's saying, and that again, it's a reg it's an iterative, regular uh, engagement with the people. Um, other than that, um, sending people um, on onto training courses. There are training courses uh, available, and there's also some information uh, on uh, on our um, online that we can they can look at. But again, we have got very few um, true true modelers uh, in the system. So the how do you control changes? Um, that's been relatively <laughs> it's not easy, but it's been relatively easy because of the few modelers um, we use. Um, uh, we have regular daily. Um, daily stand-ups, daily meetings um, the, with the modeling team to to say what they've been doing um, and areas of the model they'll be working in. And I think it's the it's the regular engagement with with the people, with everyone, um, whether it's modeling community, modeling people, or uh, the actual stakeholders. Um, we have to, you know, that's the only way that we found rather than leaving large time gaps between reviewing. Okay, thank you very much. Still uh, some questions, so let's move on. In terms of framework tailoring, are you actually changing anything in the framework data model or ontology or whatever uh, that is adding an object that natively does not exist in Capella or changing the definition of an existing object or modifying the relationship between two objects? Uh, I would say, do you develop viewpoints uh, apparently? I, I'll voice this. I think... Yeah. Um, we're not strictly training any of the existing, we're not adding anything to the existing framework. Um, what we are doing is taking the existing framework and specializing how some of those views that offer you more capability than you need can be used. So we're saying, if you're going, you know, as I said, with the, the PAB as an example, you can put so much detail onto a PAB, um, but actually having potentially three or four different paths with each with a subset of the overall detail offers a much more engaging set of information for your customers and your stakeholders so in a direct answer to your question we're not fundamentally altering the ontology okay perfect thank you uh, then can you explain in a bit more detail how you generated documentation and linked documents to views um, without going into a huge amount of detail on Mozart, um, <laughs> I, I think all I can say is um, Mozart is a, 
Talus based tool that um, uh, you create projects uh, within that. Um, you, th let's say, I'll use the word throw uh, data art various data artifacts. Some of those data artifacts would be um, uh, come from the model, some from requirements elsewhere. And then you would create what's called an assembly, assembler or assembly uh, nodes, and they um, are put together. And they're, if they're done correctly, then they're intelligent, so that they, um, if you change the data that you throw at the document, then you get a different document coming out. So it's a very we've created the nodes so that, let's for example, that will produce the document uh, style that I sort of showed earlier. It'll pull all the mission information out, it'll pull all the capabilities out. So if a new capability was to be created in the model and that project, the Mozart document generation project was, the data was refreshed in that, we would just effectively click a button and the um, uh, the Mozart document would be regenerated with the new information in it. So it's all it's all down to um, getting the, the assembler uh, uh, correct assembly nodes correct in our Mozart application. So, I, I'm I particularly I've just seen an, a comment going up through the chat. I particularly enjoy the the uh, someone here saying that they are really um, finding it difficult to search for some of the tools we're using because they're just getting classical musical references. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> okay, I can only, I can only apologise for this. <laughs> Next question then, how does TELUS capture design rationale in Capella? Is it just through text in the diagrams or descriptions or do you have any other tool that link into Capella? So I, I can take that if you want, Andrew. Yeah. Um, it depends how complex it is. Um, if it's a very simple, um, you know, couple of, couple of sentences or paragraphs, then we would probably put it into Capella. If there is uh, some a lot of discussion that was needed um, we would probably have captured that in Jira for example um, and we would we can then link that to uh, link uh, information in Jira to the um, to the model elements if we also have um, what's called uh, DARs decision uh, or design analysis reviews and that's where, where we have within Talus and we have um you know shall we shall we use this design shall we use this design and those are those are design decisions that are taken and there's a lot of information that go together into this dar pack um so that we wouldn't capture that in capella it's basically whatever information is available it might be spreadsheets um other related design information um sim yeah so it's um we can link it, but generally we would keep what's um, detailed design, design rationale rather, uh, out of Capella. Okay, thank you very much. Now uh, about functional chains, uh, are these of the individual functions? Have you used at all the concept of functional nodes, high cohesion and low coupling? Interested if you have, how these have related to functional chains? So did you want to take that, Andrew, or? Uh, so the functional chains are, in essence, um, linked sets of functions that deliver a specific capability. And there may be multiple functional chains for a given capability. And they effectively, they are, in the same way that sequences and sequence diagrams are, they're a, a, a use case in, um, in context, in essence. Um, and so it shows you the ordered functions and how you step through them in, in the system in order to get from input to output and, and achieve your capability. Um, Alex, I'm not sure, uh, do you want to talk to the functional node piece and, and the co cohesion and low coupling? No, I mean, I haven't, uh, to be honest, um, uh, not aware of the functional nodes uh, side of things, so apologies. Um... For that, we have got functions and we've got functional chains um, in the model. Um, so yeah, are all the are all the functions in the model high level? Yeah. So I mean, again, if we look at 
if we look at our system, we've got around about 40 system functions. Clearly, the the system is very, very complex, hugely complex. Um, and even in the description of a function at system level, we wouldn't capture everything that that function has, but we would capture sufficient information um, that you know that's appropriate at that level of design. Um, and that's the key thing that as we go further and further down, you elaborate more and more information and the functionals get, functions get decomposed. And even when we go into the physical architecture at the system level design, some of our subsystems are quite large, you know, um, and they need, they would, should really have, you know, be modeled in their own right. They're very complex and those would need to be broken down into further subsystems um, and then into components or whatever. So, uh, so yes, um, I don't, that probably hasn't answered your question, uh, Ian. But, um, uh, anyway, you've done your best, so not a problem. Thank you. And let's move on. Uh, I'll just give a few more minutes to questions. So uh, the next question is about the color taxonomy that you showed in your diagrams. Uh, did you actually develop a color taxonomy using same colors for the same type of connections within single diagrams or within all your diagrams? Uh, that is the that's the that's the approach that we've used yes um it is uh manual at the moment so we we're, we're, the coloring that we're doing is manually manual based and as i said we we're trying to keep that coloring um to a minimal minimum because we know it's an overhead for every diagram that we want to publish um okay thank you very much then at the beginning of the presentation you mentioned that collaboration with customers is key and should be and the, they should be considered as users however you haven't shown any views for the oa haven't you used that so again i can <laughs> you might want to say something as well i just see you smiling um we have so we have actually got a an oa level um in the model i just didn't present it today um one of the reasons that we didn't present it today um, was we haven't tailored it, um, uh, customized it, or whatever word you want to use. Um, for, so we, it wasn't relevant to this um, to this presentation. The other thing is that um, from a um, from an existing data artifact perspective, uh, we already have on the project. Uh, an operational analysis or an operational concepts document that has been handwritten, um, and we would all, all we are doing at the OA level is basically replicating that uh, that has already been done before we started doing the modeling. We would be replicating that at the OA level, but we have got it. Yeah, uh, I would add that the the stakeholders we have at the current phase of the project. Are the ones we've targeted so yes we acknowledge your the the need to interact with all stakeholders but actually the and there is a um acknowledgement that we are missing currently some of our stakeholders uh, and we've we're working a plan up to at the moment as to how we're going to interact with our next set of stakeholders as we start to disseminate this information from the system level to the the various subsystems um and, and bringing there's a the whole process of onboarding those stakeholders and and bringing them up to speed with what they need what the the model currently presents and and obviously we'll have to work with them to understand their needs as as we progress okay well thank you very very much indeed for your time and uh, your presentation uh it's never happened to me before but uh, it has happened to uh, other chairmen in our uh, Capella webinar series. There are still many questions that are unanswered and we are running really out of time. So uh, what is going to happen is that I will close this webinar, just uh, bear with me for a few minutes. And all the questions will be sent to the presenters. They will answer them offline and everything will be reintegrated in the video that will be later published online. So don't worry, the questions are not lost, uh, but we're really running out of time now. Sorry about that. So moving back to the slides, I will close the uh, 
Um, I will close the questions. So many thanks uh, to all of you for listening. We've seen all the questions already. Uh, I don't have any next webinar to announce today, but there will definitely be next webinars. So keep uh, posted. And uh, well, thank you very much, everybody, for your attention and uh, especially to our speakers today. Great talk, guys. Thank you very much indeed. And have a nice day. Goodbye.